Okay, let's see what you guys think. The first question about isolation and the training of a leader. Group two, what do you guys think? Okay. So uh, basically, I agree with the idea. Maybe the isolation can make him become a better soldier. Soldier. So as we know, the uh, battle school, they, the aim they, they aim for them to be there is to win. They don't have room to lose because they the responsibility is to protect the other human being to survive, right? So I think the time is they don't have too much time. And uh, so I think they, not just the ender, but also the commanders, they also, the CSS graph, they also, they are also under a lot of pressure. So in such a short time, then they want to change, don't forget they are just the kids. Maybe they are genius, but they are just the kids. So they have to push them to the limits. So they will try to, in the book I can see they say, maybe and now you understand that, and maybe he agrees that, is that there is a strategy. They, are, they don't try to hurt him. They want to make him strong and under such short time. So they try to be isolated him and to give him a lot of pressure to push him to limits. And so that he can, he would know how to win the respect and the friendship from the others. That's what I think. And the second part, I think maybe maybe in, in my work for and well, for Bing, because we can see from the dialogue from uh, from the page one hundred and sixty sixty six, right? You say Bing said that if you don't stop me, maybe I can be the leader of the tomb in a month. So. We can see the ender actually treat him like the way he doesn't want to be treated too. <laughs> but now he's copying, he's copying their, their ways to that, right? But now he has already understood understood why they do that to him. So he just used the, the way he might think to treat being. Yeah. So I see maybe in my work. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um your answer, I think, is quite interesting because your answer is that only by isolating them and forcing them to improve can they win other people's respect and form real friendships. I think you said something like that. Um, so I think you, this means that, uh, for example, if I am a terrible soldier and therefore, like my leaders don't like me, all the good soldiers don't like me, and I end up becoming friends with all of the other terrible soldiers. It seems like this kind of friendship is not worth having. Or in, I guess in terms of your answer, this kind of friendship would not help me improve. In Chinese, we would call this tong liu he wu, right? All of the, the low performing people gather together and they kind of um, enjoy how bad they are, <laughs> but they wouldn't improve. And I think that's part of your answer, right? Only the, in this environment, the only kind of friendship that is important is the kind that will help you keep improving. Okay. And uh, you also mentioned something very interesting in the second part of your answer. You gave a quote from page 166. This is in the bottom, the middle of the bottom half of the page. Uh, Bean smiled. That's fair. If you actually work that way, I'll be a tune leader in a month. Now, there are two ways to understand this. One, Bean is incredibly arrogant and ambitious. The other, he is a really smart guy who is accurate about his own abilities, usually. Um, but if we think of this as a kind of ambition, and he, he is ambitious, right? He asks Ender for a tune, 
He wants to lead people. So if we think of being as ambitious and he wants to be a leader, then in fact, this might be one reason why Ender is isolating him. He sees that Bean wants to be a leader, so he's helping Bean to become a leader. So it's not, or not just because Bean is a good soldier, it's also because Bean wants to be a leader that Ender starts to treat him like the teachers had treated Ender. So on the surface, it looks like Ender is unconsciously abusing Bean, and then later on he's thinking, why did I do that? But on another level, Ender is re reacting or responding to the ambition of this kid who also wants to be a leader. Either way, it's a kind of instinct, as I think you also talked about instinct last week. It's a kind of instinct, but whether it is abusive or uh, educational depends on how you think about the situation. OK, thank you. Other groups, do you have ideas about this question? OK, let's move on. Question two, group one. This is about Ender's separation from a lie and the way that he thinks about this separation. Group one, do you agree with the way that Ender thinks about this? Group one agrees with the general idea of how Ender thinks about his new relationship with a lie, but they disagree with the word infinitely. They must be infinitely apart. And in fact, based on the evidence that group one gave us or w gives us, the book also disagrees with this word. So first of all, the separation. Why must they be separated? At this point, Ender is leading an army, his own army, and Ally is a member or maybe leader of another army. So in the rules of the battle school, they have to fight each other, which means that they have to be careful about what they say to each other in case they give away information or strategy. They have to maintain a sense of loyalty with their army and between members of their army. So whether it is intellectually or emotionally, they must be separate most of the time. Uh, and group one mentions that this is specifically a strategy used by the teachers for all of the students, uh, going back to the first question, to keep all of them separate and to help each of them improve individually. So this is part of the tragedy of this scene. They are apart not because they want to be apart, but because the world that they live in has separated them. Um, I often come back to this idea, right? How does the world of the story, blah, blah, blah. This is one way that the world of the story affects uh, the characters. But group one says it's not infinitely apart. 
If we look at page 171, two paragraphs from the bottom. The next day, he passed a lie in the corridor. Corridor means hallway. And they greeted each other, touched hands, talked. But they both knew that there was a wall now. Okay, so that's the separation part. It might be breached, which means to break through that wall sometime in the future. So it's not forever. Maybe in the future they might break through the wall and come together again. But for now, the only real conversation between them was the roots that had already grown low and deep under the wall where they could not be broken. So on the surface, it looks like they are separate, but still they have that connection underground. And underground in this case means in the past. They have a, a history of friendship that keeps them not entirely separate. Um, during the discussion part, I heard group one talk about the fact that they are now strangers. But as this paragraph tells us, they are not strangers. Uh, they're friends who have been forced apart by circumstance. Um, so that's what group one says. They are apart, but not infinitely apart. And in fact, if we connect this situation with the world of the story or the situation of the story, they are apart because of the training program and they are doing this training to fight the aliens. Then in fact, this paragraph is a very hopeful. Sometime in the future, they might come together again. Why? Maybe because after they win the war, they don't need to keep fighting. They can come back together as friends. Uh, so this is the kind of idea that we can only see if we consider not just the characters, but also the world of the story around them. They're apart because of the situation, and so if they come back together in the future, maybe the situation will improve. Thank you, group one. Other groups, do you have thoughts or questions about uh, number two? OK, question three. This is my question. Uh, and this part is telling us how Ender trains his soldiers. Uh, at this point, we have seen him uh, like give lectures and order his new soldiers to do things, and he's kind of uh, not very polite about it, right? He sounds loud and, and angry even. He has high expectations of his soldiers. But then at this point, it says that when he worked with an individual, he was always patient. So the question is, do you think this might be a good idea? And I think it could be a good idea. Because when he is training his army as a group, they are a group. And so there's a kind of balance. One leader with power, a group of people with no power. It's kind of balanced, right? Um, and at the same time, this also means that whoever like the, the individual soldier does not have to bear all of that angry energy it's the other i think it was 39 people 40 people who bear the energy together they are facing their um tough leader together as a group so in fact, by yelling at all of them at the same time, Ender is creating a group atmosphere, a group loyalty. Uh, the individual soldiers know that they are not the only person who is experiencing this. So they already have a shared experience, a shared history, even a shared attitude toward their commander, whether it's a good attitude or not. But at least they're together. It makes them into one army. But that's the danger, right? Because they're all one army against their leader. <laughs> it's not a good situation when they actually have to fight. 
And so that's where the second part comes in. Ender asks them to do um, advanced things. He asks his army to perform very, very well. But when he divides them into groups and like uh, lets them learn and help each other, that's when he also becomes a helper, when he is able to focus on each individual soldier's um, progress and their need. And that shows the army that he's not just some enemy who shouts at his soldiers and then doesn't care about them. This shows that that kind of anger, that kind of energy is for a purpose. It's out of a sense of wanting them to really learn. Another way to think about this is um, you guys know the carrot and the stick, right? It's uh, it's an English saying about how um, there are two ways to lead a donkey. You can like hang a carrot in front of them, uh, in front of it, or you can use a stick to hit it to make it go, right? So yelling at the entire group is the stick, but helping each individual soldier is the carrot. So there's positive and negative energy. There's antagonism, DE, and there's assistance. Uh, so in this way, you can we can say that um, this kind of leadership forms a multi-dimensional relationship with the followers. It's not just someone who yells at them. It's not just someone who helps them. It's both. Uh, at the same time, there is a disadvantage to this strategy. Because it's always the leader who is doing things, right? Uh, Ender is the one who's yelling. Ender is the one who's helping. So in a certain way, it deprives his followers of agency, xing, what we call like active learning ability. It's always because somebody is holding a carrot or somebody is holding a stick. Um, so if in this story, Ender is training soldiers, so the problem is not that serious because soldiers will always have to follow orders. But if your purpose is to, for example, uh, foster personal growth and help someone become a full person, then the idea of giving the student or follower some space to, so that they can make their own decisions, they can better understand themselves, is also an important part of education and learning and growth. And this is something that this particular strategy is not very good at, because Ender's always there. Even when divided into separate groups, each group knows that if they're stuck, if they need help, Ender will come along sometime and, and give them some help. Uh, this also goes back to the first question, isolation. This kind of training does not provide enough isolation uh, to help the followers become self-reliant. They don't rely on other people. Also, this is kind of what I've been doing with you guys, right? I give you tough questions and then like as you discuss, I go around and help you. OK, uh, so thank you group. Which group was this? Me, thank you, me. OK, so other groups, do you have questions about this one or thoughts about this one? OK, let's move on. Actually, no, let's take a let's take a break. We don't have a lot of time left this period. Um, and we'll come back for question four.
Question four. In the dead of night, after Ender wins his physical fight with Bonso, he calls Bean over to his room and asks Bean to help him come up with new ideas so that he will not lose any games in the future. And when Bean asks him why is this so important, Ender says, I can't lose any games. First of all, do you agree, Group 4? And secondly, why can't he lose any games? Group 4 points out that Ender is not just another student. He's not just another soldier. He is the guy that everyone thinks will win the war. So Group 4 agrees that Ender really cannot lose any game. Everybody is depending on him to win the war. He is the only one everyone thinks can do it. In other words, everybody looks at him as a hero, maybe even a savior or a messiah. Um, he's not a normal average person. He is like a super person. So they have a lot of faith and trust in him. What would happen if he loses one game? People, according to group four, people may start to think that, oh, it's possible for him to lose. Maybe there's somebody that is just as good as he is. Maybe not all the time, maybe not in every battle, but maybe once in a while when he's weak or he's sleepy or he's sick, maybe it's possible to beat him. And if it's possible for a human to beat him, then it's also possible for an alien to beat him. And so if he loses just one game, there would be the seed of doubt in people's minds. Up to this point, as group three later will tell us, the entire battle school, even the entire system of the world is designed to produce somebody like Ender. If, they, if this entire world system cannot produce the perfect leader, then the entire effort has been wasted. So if Ender loses one game and people start to doubt his ability at all times to win, then people would also start to doubt the system that has been built to create somebody like Ender. And if they start to doubt the system, they will start to doubt uh, the the government, the rules, the entire situation of their world. But from the point of view of the military, they need the world to come together to support 
their effort in order to have the best chance to win the war. So this is why Ender believes that he cannot lose a single game. It would entirely destroy the war effort of humanity. But there's a second part to this question. If he loses a game, other people might start thinking he could possibly lose the war. But what would Ender himself think? If he loses one game, would he change as a leader? Group four says yes. They also think that Ender would change. Uh, maybe he would lose his faith in himself. He would know that it is possible for him to lose. And if we go a step further, if he loses and like nothing terrible happens, maybe he doesn't get promoted, maybe he gets sent home, but he's alive and he can still enjoy his time with friends and Valentine, then maybe he would realize that losing is not so bad. It, it's in some way of thinking, it's not always the end of the world. Uh, and this would also be terrible for the military. If Ender is, uh, he starts to accept the possibility of losing, then there's no guarantee that he would try, he would, try his best to win the war. Uh, so from the logic of the war and the military training, it is true, Ender cannot lose any games. But think about that kind of pressure. You have all been through the exams for college, right? So you already have a sense of that kind of pressure. You know, if you miss one question that you're not supposed to miss, uh, you might uh, lose your chance to study what you want to study, something like that. But in your case, it was it was fine. Ming Chuan is not too not uh, such a terrible place. You're you're still alive. You can still enjoy life. You still have friends. But in Ender's case, if he loses one game and the entire world starts to doubt the uh, their faith in him to win the war. Can you imagine how terrible that pressure must be on him? And that's why in this chapter, we finally see that side of this character Ender when he his voice cracks, which means like uh, he's about to cry when he talks to Bean. Uh, let's look at page 197. It's also interesting in this scene, uh, we've been talking about everybody else's faith in Ender and Ender's reaction. In this scene, Bean represents everybody else. So on page 197, Bean says something that he says things like, you're the best Ender, or they can't break you. Right? He expresses a simple faith and trust in Ender's leadership. But then Ender says uh, in the third to last paragraph, three from the bottom. After Bean says, they can't break you. Ender replies, you'd be surprised. Ender breathed sharply, suddenly, as if there were a stab of pain, or he had to catch a sudden breath in the wind. Bean looked at him and realized that the impossible was happening. Far from baiting him, or like teasing him, Ender Wigan was actually confiding in him. Not much, but a little. Ender was human, and Bean had been allowed to see. So at the beginning of this paragraph, it says he breathed sharply, suddenly. Uh, we, in English, we call this a dry heave or a dry sob. This is chi. So he's about to cry. He's about to crack under that pressure. And in fact, it's because of this pressure that he calls Bean to his room. It's why he asks Bean to try to come up with new ideas to help him never lose a game. This scene 
is also quite special. It is one of the few scenes in the book where Ender is in the scene, but we don't see the scene from his point of view. In this place, we're looking at Ender through Bean's point of view. Right, most of the time uh, we're walking around with Ender, whatever he sees, we see, whatever he thinks, we think. But here, we are standing with Bean, and only when Bean realizes that Ender is cracking, do we, the reader, realize the same thing. And it's because of um, the need to give us that sense of surprise. To feel surprised that Ender is also human and is also weak. That's why this scene looks at Ender from the outside. If we look at this scene from the inside, it would basically be Ender full of anxiety and fear and all of his negative emotions. Um, but that's not what the novel wants. The novel wants us to understand Ender as a kind of leader, whether it's his personal growth or his effect on other people. So this scene, the scene of the, the vulnerability of the leader, we see this scene from the outside. Okay, thank you, group four. Other groups, do you want to add or ask about this one? Okay, let's move on to group five. So chapter 12 features a fight with Bonso, um, but at the beginning of this chapter, um, Colonel Graf and I think it's General Pace are talking about the possibility of this fight, or I guess the inevitability of this fight. It's going to happen. And Pace asks Graf, you know it's going to happen. Why aren't you stopping the fight? And so this question is asking group three, do you agree with Graf's answer? So group three gave, uh, I think, a quite surprising answer. They agree with Graf's reasoning. His reasoning is that uh, the same for question one. We must always isolate Ender and make him believe that nobody will save him. Because in the real war, nobody will save him. So if he cannot solve all his problems by himself, how do we know that he will be able to solve the biggest problem of winning the war. But then uh, if we look at General Pace's uh, response on at the top of page 202, the first paragraph is Graf, the second paragraph is General Pace. Uh, so the second paragraph. 
he will also not reach the peak of his abilities if he is dead or permanently crippled. And Graf's response is simply to say, he won't be. Group three agrees that this is not a very rational response. Instead, it seems more like a, a leap of faith, an act of belief in Ender. Um, and so group three's answer goes back to question four. It seems that it's not just about Ender's abilities, it's also about people's faith in Ender. If people have any reason to doubt, any of the smallest reasons to doubt Ender, that automatically, or I guess immediately, weakens the human war effort. Uh, and it opens the door to all kinds of doubting and suspicion and ulterior motives and other kinds of subplots and treachery. It's like Pandora's box, right? Pandora hoods. Once you open it, all of the dark and negative thoughts come rushing out and you, you can't control them anymore. And so the way that Graf tries to keep Pandora's box closed is to demonstrate to everybody that Ender is the guy to lead humans to victory, that he can solve these life or death problems by himself. So actually, according to group three, Graf's, the reason that Graf gives to General Pace is not the real reason. It's not to prove to, it, it's not a kind of test to make sure Ender is a good leader. It's a kind of opportunity to convince everybody else that Ender is the right guy. Graf already believes that it is Ender. He doesn't need to test Ender. The test is for everybody else. Uh, of course, that's not the whole story because throughout chapter 12, it is very interesting. Chapter 12 is uh, one of the emotionally more vulnerable chapters. Every other chapter, Ender is like, oh, we're going to do this, and he wins. Oh, we're going to do that, and he wins. But in this chapter, throughout the whole chapter, he keeps thinking, surely the teachers know that Bonzo wants me dead. Surely the teachers will come and stop the fight. So the way that this chapter is written makes us want to also think that Ender needs to pass this test to believe in himself, to finally abandon all hope that somebody could help him, that he to really make him believe that he can only depend on himself. But as I said, this is the only chapter that he thinks this, maybe with the exception of uh, chapter four, when he first gets on the shuttle to go to space, Right, remember, he thinks of Graf as his friend, and then Graf like tortures him psychologically, and then he realizes, oh, Graf is not my friend. He wants to isolate me. These are the only two places in the book where Ender, uh, we get a clear sense that Ender is depending on other people. To me, I think that feels a bit, uh, we call this overdetermined, which means that this situation has more than the necessary reasons. Uh, in plain English, it means that it is, it feels fake. The author deliberately added this stuff to justify the plot. It doesn't feel like uh, something that would naturally happen in this kind of story. Like if you watch a bad movie, uh, and something like ridiculous or, or illogical happens. Why is that there? The answer is because, well, we need to help the hero get to that place. We need to help the hero do something. Therefore, it has been arranged in this kind of situation. That is overdetermined. Uh, so I think this part is also similar. Uh, according to Group 3's analysis, we don't need to see Ender... Uh, looking for help, because that's not the point of Graf's logic. 
the point of graph's logic is to help everybody else see that Ender is the guy. So really, like we we, uh, it, it doesn't really matter if Ender is looking for help or if he is preparing to save himself. Either way, the logic of this fight would still work. Um, and from what we know of Ender, he does not seem like the kind of person who would look for help very easily. So it, it goes against what we know of him as a character. I think that there's something else I wanted to say. I can't quite remember. Yeah, OK, so uh, thank you, group three. Other uh, other groups, do you want to add your thoughts or questions? OK. Um, I think what I wanted to say is that this is just like another game that we talked about in question four. The logic is very similar. If he lo if Ender loses this fight, even if he lives and he can still lead the military, the effect on everybody else would be the same as if he lost any of the battle games. People would lose faith in him. So it's actually a very separate question from what would happen to Ender? Would he be killed? It's a different question. Right, OK, so um, that's this week's discussion. Before next week, please finish the novel. So let's go back to chapter 12. No, chapter 10. And have a closer look at what is going on. So that's page 154. Again, we have this opening dialogue. Now? I suppose so, which means I guess so. It has to be an order, Colonel Graf. Armies don't move because a commander says, I suppose it's time to attack. I'm not a commander, I'm a teacher of little children. <laughs> Colonel, sir, I admit I was on you, which means I was like uh, on your case. I was tough on you, like I was uh, against you, basically. I admit I was a pain in the ass, but it worked. Everything worked just like you wanted it to. The last few weeks, Ender's even been been. Happy. Content. He's doing well. His mind is keen. His play is excellent. Young as he is, we've never had a boy better prepared for command. Usually they go at 11, but at nine and a half, he's top flight. So up to this point, now we know what they're talking about. They say that Ender is now ready for command. So they're talking about giving him an army. And this part also tells us his age. He's nine and a half. He entered battle school at six. Now he's nine and a half. Um, there are a few other things we can notice about this dialogue so far. First of all, why does Colonel Graf hesitate? Right, just as I think the other person is Major Anderson, just as Anderson says, an army does not move because its commander says, I guess so. So why is Graf hesitating? Is there something about this decision that he doesn't like? Putting Ender in a command of an army at such a young age. What are some problems that might happen with this? If, for example, you take a new class and the professor walks in and she is 16 years old, how would you feel? It would feel kind of strange, right? Like I'm paying so much money to learn in this school and in walks in this child, this teenager. Like this has to be a joke, right? 
even though it might be a genius teenager, you would still feel kind of strange. Something similar is happening to Ender. And uh, Major Anderson says usually they take command at 11. So Ender is taking command a year and a half before usual. The next youngest commander would be a year and a half older than he is. And uh, the next youngest commander would be the second best commander, right? The better you are, the younger you are when you're promoted. Which means that most of the other soldiers who are not promoted will also be older than Ender. He would be the youngest person at his level or even at a higher level. Uh, and so perhaps this is what Graf is worried about. Like, yes, Graf has been tough on Ender. He has put Ender in different situations. But this is the first time that Ender will actually have to be a leader. An official leader. Right? He has been leading training sessions, but this time he will have the support and rule system of the institution. Uh, he would be an official leader, and that is a big change. So maybe this is why Graf is hesitating. The second thing we can notice is when Graf says, happy. It doesn't sound like he is happy that Ender's happy. Right? He doesn't say, well, yes, he's happy. He doesn't say, it's great, he's happy. He says, happy. It's like he's kind of disappointed. It's not what he wanted. And it's true, Graf doesn't want Ender to be happy. He wants Ender to be great. So this result is kind of not what he was looking for. And in fact, uh, Anderson doesn't think happy is the right word. He thinks content is the right word, manzu, satisfied. And that to graph is very dangerous because if you're content and you're satisfied, you stop trying to improve. And this is, and you know, this is still in the middle of his training. He should still be improving. So the fact that he looks happy or content is not a good thing. Even though he is the best soldier so far, uh, he's not good enough. He needs to keep improving. Uh, so let's keep going. Last paragraph of page 154. Well, yes, for a few moments there, for a few minutes there, it actually occurred to me to wonder what kind of a man would heal a broken child of some of his hurt just so he could throw him back into battle again. A little private moral dilemma. Please overlook it. I was tired. So yes, the reason he is hesitating is because he sees that Ender is happy or content, and he's thinking, what are we going to do to him next? Saving the world, remember? Call him in. We're doing what must be done, Colonel Graf. Come on, Anderson, you're just dying to see how he handles all those rigged games I had you work out. So this is another piece of information. In the future, the games that he that Ender will fight will be rigged, which means they will be unfair. That's a pretty low thing to. So I'm a low kind of guy. Come on, Major. We're both the scum of the earth. Uh, he's talking about how they treat the children. I'm dying to see how he handles them too. After all, our lives depend on him doing real well. Ne? You're not starting to use the boy's slang, are you? Call him in, Major. I'll dump the rosters into his files and give him his security system. What we're doing to him isn't all bad, you know. He gets his privacy again. 
Isolation, you mean? The loneliness of power. Go call him in. This is very interesting coming from Graf. Graf is, of course, the leader of the battle school. He is the only leader of the battle school. He is the only person who can make the final decision. So when he talks about the loneliness of power, it's not just theory. He also lives with the loneliness of power. The idea that it has to be him who decides. Nobody else. Yes, sir. I'll be back with him in 15 minutes. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope you had fun. I hope you had a nice, nice time being happy, Ender. It might be the last time in your life. Welcome, little boy. Your dear Uncle Graf has plans for you. The last paragraph is actually quite literary. It's Graf talking to himself. And at this point, Anderson has left the room. And so Graf is just talking to himself. I call it literary because it actually reflects a classic short story by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and in this story, a guy at the bar is drinking and he's thinking about the emptiness of life. And he starts talking to himself. And the more he talks, the less sense that he makes. So this literary allusion makes us understand that, or lets us understand that Graf also is facing the emptiness of life. He has one mission to train the leader who will win the war. But after that, what will he do? There's no other part of his life. His entire life has been directed toward this one goal. And now that the goal is, being, is close to being achieved, and in some sense, he has to face the emptiness of the rest of his life. Same question for you guys, right? What are you going to do after you graduate? When nobody is forcing you to go to classes and pass tests, what are you going to do? It can be a scary question. Oh, this part is also kind of foreshadowing. You're in my movie. If nobody's in the room, how do we know what Graf is saying? This will come back in chapter, I think, 14 or 15. Okay, let's begin the chapter proper. Ender knew what was happening from the moment they brought him in. So again, he's very smart. He knows what's going on. Everyone expected him to go commander early, perhaps not this early, but he had topped the standings almost continuously for three years. No one else was remotely close to him, and his evening practices had become the most prestigious group in the school. There were some who wondered why the teachers had waited this long. He wondered which army they'd give him. Three commanders were graduating soon, including Petra, but it was beyond hope for them to give him Phoenix Army. No one ever succeeded to command of the same army he was in when he was promoted. So this tells us that he is currently in Phoenix Army, and his leader is currently Petra. The, if you remember the movie, she's the girl who trains him. Anderson took him first to his new quarters. That sealed it. Only commanders had private rooms. Then he had him fitted for new uniforms and a new flash suit. Uh, the flash suit is the suit they use in the battle room. He looked on the forms to discover the name of his army. Dragon, said the form. There was no dragon army. I've never heard of dragon army, Ender said. 
That's because there hasn't been a dragon army in four years. We discontinued the name because there was a superstition about it. No dragon army in the history of the battle school ever won even a third of its games. It got to be a joke. Well, why are you reviving it now? We had a lot of extra uniforms to use up. <laughs> That's obviously not the reason. Uh, the reason is very clearly to add yet another obstacle to Ender's success. To try not to help him in any way. Uh, there are two ways to understand this. One, to give him a brand new army so that there would be no image or expectation from all of the other students. Like if he took over an existing army, he would get soldiers who are already part of a group and he would, uh, everybody would be thinking, OK, with a new commander, how will this army change? They will already have an idea of this army and they will compare Ender to that idea. But by giving Ender an entirely new army, people would not have that kind of expectation. They would not make that kind of comparison. And also the soldiers, as we will see a bit later, also brand new soldiers. Um, they are not from the same army. So Ender has the chance to create his own army from the very beginning. Now the second meaning is, as Anderson just said, Dragon used to be a terrible army. So uh, that even if most of the students don't remember Dragon Army, Ender now knows that Dragon has this history, and it's yet another thing that he has to overcome in order to be a good leader. Grab sat at his desk, looking fatter and wearier than the last time Ender had seen him. He handed Ender his hook, the small box that allowed commanders to go where they wanted in the battle room during practices. Some said that they worked magnetically, some said it was gravity. <laughs> this is cool. So this sentence tells us uh, regular people don't know how it works. It's a military secret. Many times during his evening practice sessions, Ender had wished that he had a hook instead of having to rebound off walls to get where he wanted to go. Now that he would got quite deft at maneuvering without one, so he's very good at getting where he wants to go. Here it was. It's a bit of irony, right? He used to want one, but now that he doesn't need one, he gets one. It only works, Anderson pointed out, during your regularly scheduled practice sessions. Since Ender already planned to have extra practices, it meant the hook would only be useful some of the time. It also explained why so many commanders never held extra practices. They depended on the hook, and it wouldn't do anything for them during the extra times. If they felt that the hook was their authority, their power over the other boys, then they were even less likely to work without it. That's an advantage I'll have over some of my enemies, Ender thought. God, this guy is smart. <laughs> he realizes that he cannot depend on something for his power and authority. His power and authority have to come from himself. Uh, from history, think about the scepter, Quanzang. Whoever holds the scepter is the king. But this also means that if you can take the scepter and defend it, you become the king. But for Ender, he knows that if he doesn't rely on anything, then the only way to defeat him is to actually beat him. It makes himself uh, more directly linked to his power and authority. And this is also a very interesting way of thinking about 
dependence. If you depend on the thing, then you are giving the thing some of your power. Other commanders depend on the hook, so when they don't have the hook, they have lost some of their power. For example, power over movement in space. If they're not willing to think about how do I get there without using this tool, that is an ability that they are not practicing. So by relying on nothing else, Ender is making sure that he himself has the necessary abilities. Graf's official welcome speech sounded bored and over rehearsed. Only at the end did he begin to sound interested in his own words. We're doing something unusual with Dragon Army. I hope you don't mind. We've assembled a new army by advancing the equivalent of an entire launch course early and delaying the graduation of quite a few advanced students. So let's think about the math. There are 40, uh, 40 regular soldiers in an army. Each launch group has 20 new kids. So Graf says that they created this new army by promoting an entire launch course. So that's 20 people. And by delaying the graduation of a few others. So I guess they delayed graduation for 20 other people. So a total of 40 students. And it sounds like around 20 of these students will be pretty terrible, right? No experience. Page 157. I think you'll be pleased with the quality of your soldiers. I hope you are because we're forbidding you to transfer any of them. Bum, bum, bum. No trades, asked Ender. It was how commanders always shored up their weak points by trading around. None. You see, you've been conducting your extra practice sessions for three years now. You have a following. Many good soldiers will put unfair pressure on their commanders to trade them into your army. We've given you an army that can, in time, be competitive. We have no intention of letting you dominate unfairly. So again, Graf gives a bullshit reason. He says you can't trade because other people might try to get in your army unfairly. But the real reason is in the next paragraph. Ender asks, what if I've got a soldier I just can't get along with? And Graf answers, get along with him. So again, you have to solve your own problems. You can't depend on others to help you. Uh, and in a military setting, this makes a lot of sense. By the time Ender will lead the military attack on the aliens, all of his soldiers will have been chosen for him. So he has to work with the people he has been assigned with. In English, we, we call this to play the hand that you're dealt. Uh, at this point, we think this is just part of his training, right? Uh, a good leader has to be able to work with anybody. Only later will we, re will we realize that this is, in fact, the same situation that Ender will be in in the real uh, war. Graf closed his eyes, Anderson stood up, and the interview was over. Dragon was assigned the colors gray, orange, gray. Ender changed into his flash suit, then followed the ribbons of light until he came to the barracks that contained his army. They were there already, milling around near the entrance. Ender took charge at once. Bunking will be arranged by seniority. Veterans to the back of the room, newest soldiers to the front. It was the reverse of the usual pattern, and Ender knew it. He also knew that he didn't intend to be like many commanders who never even saw the younger boys because they were always in the back. So 
this is his first leadership decision to arrange sleeping uh, organization opposite to how it's usually done. Do you think this is a good decision? It's not bad. Andrew gives a good reason. He wants to be able to see his youngest and weakest soldiers. Um, and so from this we can infer that other commanders care more about their older and better soldiers. Uh, perhaps the idea is that they want to be near people who are good or who are on a similar level of training. But Ender doesn't care about finding people like him. He doesn't care about feeling like he's part of a group. Ender cares about making his army the best army possible. And that means focusing on the younger and weaker soldiers. So that's why he wants to spend more time with the young guys. And he wants to see who they are. As they sorted themselves out according to their arrival dates, Ender walked up and down the aisle. Almost 30 of his soldiers were new, straight out of their launch group, completely inexperienced in battle. Some were even under age. The ones nearest the door were pathetically small. Ender reminded himself that that's how he must have looked to Bonso Madrid when he first arrived. Still, Bonso had had only one underage soldier to cope with. Not one of the veterans belonged to Ender's elite practice group. None had ever been a tomb leader. None, in fact, was older than Ender himself, which meant that even his veterans didn't have more than 18 months experience. Some he didn't even recognize they had made so little impression. So this paragraph gives us a lot of important information. What kind of people will Ender be leading? Most of this information sounds terrible, right? No experience, no leadership experience. Some people Ender doesn't even know, like he doesn't even recognize. He's been the best soldier for three years fighting all of the armies and some people he doesn't even recognize. So these are like the marginal people, the younger people, the weaker people, the unimportant people. But there's one piece of information that is good for Ender. Nobody is older than he is. So he doesn't have to worry about somebody feeling jealous of Ender's leadership. Now, it does sound like this is a pretty shitty situation, but on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, this means that they don't have um, bad habits. Right? If you remember in the movie, when Petra is training Ender to shoot, uh, Petra says, that's good, you don't have any bad habits. And Ender says, I don't have any good habits either. And then Petra says, I'll give you those. And that's what's going on in this scene. These soldiers are, are new and inexperienced, that, but that also means that they don't have bad habits. And so they're open to whatever Ender will teach them. Uh, in fact, as we read the novel, we sometimes we will note that uh, some scenes will have the same logic as a different scene in the movie. Like that example I was just talking about. In the book, we don't see Petra, or we do see Petra training Ender, but they don't say that line. They don't express that idea. That idea comes here. Um, so like the movie is actually a pretty accurate adaptation of the book, but some of the ideas have been moved around to fit somewhere else in the story. But really, most of the ideas are in the movie. OK, let's stop here. Do you have questions? Great, finish the story before next week. <laughs>